Good morning. Happy Thursday. I have neural coffee in hand and it is perfect. So, so the, the one thing that you want to be able to do in this situation is you have to be able to deconstruct the demands of the elements when you're talking about sprinting. So are we talking about a start? Are we talking about a, a, a rolling start? Are we talking about a run up? Are we talking about um, acceleration from a dead stop? Are we talking about transition to top speed? Are we talking about top speed? It's like, so, so each of those elements has very specific demands um, to, to perform at, 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 at peak performance, right? So now you got to say, what are you working on? Right. And then, then you deconstruct that element and then that kind of leans you towards <clears throat> what, what type of a method that, that you're going to use. Okay. You know who, you know, would be really good with this. If only Eric Huddleston was on the call. Oh, Eric Huddleston is on the call. Eric, Eric does a lot of this stuff. So he breaks a lot of this stuff down. Um, and, and is very creative with, with the application of like certain types of jumps, for instance. So how do you know when to have somebody do a, a seated, like a, like a, seated on a box to, to a jump versus a counter movement versus, you know, something on single leg versus something that, that's low amplitude, high frequency, um, uh, oscillatory impulses and things like that. And so, so again, you just have to kind of deconstruct what element you are emphasizing, right? So top speed would look a whole lot different than, than acceleration because the ground contact times are different. The body orientation is different the, the uh, shape through the axial skeleton is radically different. And so you have to take all of those things into consideration. It always comes down to, to the direct monitoring of, of the training on that day for that person with, with the background. If you collect enough data points of performance over time, it is infinitely more useful than, than slapping some sort of monitoring device on somebody. Um, and I know you, I know who you've trained with. So um, have you ever noticed when, when you guys are doing like, like power oriented stuff that you see the decline in velocity, like you physically observe it, right? You can see it happen. There you go. How much better, how much better is the device than your eyeballs when you see somebody slowly reduce their velocity? Maybe a rep, you know, like, like, so serious. So, so the way when we've got we've got some gadgets. We do we still Eric? Do we still use the gym aware at all? Uh, we have it. We don't. I, don't, I haven't used it in a long time. Okay, I was gonna say yeah. We just we just again it it, it didn't add so much that we go wow you know because because I, I want I want a wow moment or nothing when when it comes to that kind of stuff. It's like it's like just kind of having it to play with is is not it's not worth it for me. Again, it's not worth 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 the expense. And so. Um, what 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 I used to do when I worked by myself when, when we're measuring power output is, is so like if somebody was okay we can go back to um, Lucas's question a little bit we have somebody that's like, it's like a like a grinder versus somebody that's more elastic you know what I'm talking about and so when you're when you're trying to determine their their qualities what I used to have them do is I would take somewhere between sixty and seventy percent of their one RM and I would say I want you to be able to do five reps in less than five seconds with this weight. And if they could do it with 70% of, of their one RM, five reps for five seconds, which is really fast for, for that kind of a load. It's like, I was pretty happy with that. That would be, that would be one of my goals for somebody that is trying to become more, more explosive to move that kind of a load that quickly. And again, that didn't, I mean, I, I had a little stopwatch that I would, that I would use to make sure that I was on five seconds. Right just as useful, just as useful as any monitoring device that, that I, I've ever used. And if you need more parameters, like, like there's some really cool stuff with force plates and things where you can see that the, where it produces the, the curve, where you can see the, the overcoming and yielding strategies, and that can refine some of your, some of your choices, like I said, but that's, and again, that's when I'm talking to, to the guys that are working in the NBA, like they'll use that kind of information to help target some things, but but again, for almost all normal people, yeah, 
I don't, I, I'm, a not, I'm not a gadget guy. I don't even use a goniometer for gosh sakes. And then let's take it back to, it's, it's getting cold out and you're at IFAST. Mm -hmm. And do you guys have a true form treadmill or like one of those, um, the belt powered ones? Okay. Yeah. Let's theoretically put one into IFAST. And Eric, you can uh, feel free to answer this one. Is that one Are of those you guys... things? Is that yeah, one? yeah, okay. yeah. Right. Are you guys implementing that as training for sprinting? No. Okay. <laughs> that, that's kind of what I theorized. What a great was. answer. Thanks for all that detail. <laughs> um, no. I, um, and a few words. That's kind of what I thought. Okay. So Eric, let's just say you're, you're presented in that, that context. What, what are some of your training strategies? What are you kind of like trying to attack? Well, uh, sorry. Can you go back to like what the goal of it is? Like what, what am I, what am I trying to do? Prolong the acceleratory period. So people don't pop up as quick. I mean, I guess that's a situation where I might just, I don't know, like how beneficial is heavy strength training at that point going to be so i had this longer runway to produce force so that's where we get into stuff like like do i really need to work on the sprint by itself or is this something that i can put chains on a squat with and have me like sit up like stand up from a box and it takes like i'm, I'm increasing the load as i'm standing up and all this other stuff so it anything really that's going to it that's going to increase the amount of time that I have to push through an exercise theoretically is going to apply to that. So, um, I mean, it doesn't have to be anything plyometric. It doesn't have like, honestly, I think plyometrics, if, if we're doing a true plyometric and it's unresisted and all this other stuff, it's probably going to take away from that, like from delaying that acceleration anyways, because it should be a quick movement. So if we're looking at something that's going to be more long, uh, like a long push, increase load for it to be a long push. Now, obviously like that's case dependent, but um, if we're talking about general, like somebody that walks in the gym, that would probably be a strategy that I would use. So have you found within your model, is there like some sort of progressive compensation patterns that, you know, your different archetypes have? Like if it's a wide, is this typically the place that they go first? And if they go there and they need to go, have you, is there like a, step process there like sequence that? yeah sequence yes sir two strategies right we talk about expansion and compression all compensatory strategies will lead you towards a more compressive strategy eventually but when you look at the archetype they're going to be biased in one direction so so your narrows tend to to rely on a an expansion strategy because of shape the the wides tend to rely on a compressive strategy because of shape which means that they will be but like so so the narrows will be biased towards inhalation the, the yeah. wides will be biased towards exhalation pretty straightforward yes yeah. okay if you're biased towards exhalation we'll just say exhalation right um you have to then compensate to breathe in and you will do that, you will do that uh, diaphragmatically. There's a, there's a really simple way for the diaphragm to, to compensate for that, right? So that's how you breathe back in against a body that's trying to exhale. So that's compensation number one. The shape of that diaphragm promotes compression in a certain place, and then the resulting expansion as a byproduct of that and then that creates a center of gravity issue over your feet. So, so if I expand somewhere, I will move in that direction. Mm -hmm. So when I have a wide, the shape of the diaphragm as they compensate creates a, a, a posterior expansion in the lower rib cage, which knocks you backwards. Okay. So that means you're going to need a compressive strategy to stop that from happening so you don't fall backwards. And so you create a strategy there, right? And, and it's not the posterior lower, by the way, that's gonna be the last thing, that's end game. But your what, what happens- lower is end game, sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's gonna be the last place you go. Because again, the shape of the diaphragm determines where the expansion is. So I gotta create compression somewhere else. And so, so you create a posterior compression that shoves you forward. 
And then by creating the compression on the backside, you create an expansion on the front side as a byproduct of that compression. And then that throws you forward. And then you need a compressive strategy on the front side to push you back so you don't fall forward. And it just goes bing, 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 bing. You go back and forth a bunch of times. And then each one is compressed, 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 compressed. And that's how you end up. So when we talk about, when I say end game, I say that because of the Marvel movies, by the way, because um, they're, they're really cool. Yep. It's, a nice way to, it's, it's a nice way to express when somebody has utilized all of their available strategies. So you said sequential. So does that mean like from a consistent basis, it's not really as case dependent. You're just trying to see where they're at in that kind of train of compression, how far okay. they are in the sequence. You are correct. Okay. Yes. And so, so that, so that's what your measures tell you. Your, your measures tell you how, how impactful the compensatory strategies are. And technically they're not even compensations. It's just reality, right? I call them compensatory strategies. So you know that they're not they're not what you're chasing as an ideal when you're trying to recover uh, range of motion. But there, it's just it's just trying to stay up, up on upright on two feet based on your physical structure under the circumstances within the context that you're you're performing. And that's where the chessboard really comes into play because then you can really start to piece together where they're actually at in that sequence. Yeah. So. So when you lay out your chessboard, and I think I've mentioned this before on these calls, eventually what you should be able to do when you look at a chessboard. So if somebody else took the measurements and you're looking at this person's chessboard, you should get this 3D representation in your head as to what shape this person is. Right. So you would know where the expansion capabilities are. You would know where the compressive strategies are that are interference. And you, you really should be able to get an idea of what this person looks like. And that's that's when you that's when you develop the superpower, um, and it, and I think everybody can do it. It's just a matter of reps. It's just a bunch of reps.